Hey guys, thanks for joining us on the Best Practices Show podcast. I am your host, Kirk Barrett, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices all over the world. And boy, do I have a treat today. Somebody who I've never met, who I've heard about, had a chance to speak with in certain circles. You are going to love this. I've got Chuck Blakeman on with me today, and he is fantastic. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button. You are absolutely going to love this. Now, two things. Number one, if you're showing up here for the first time, I want to congratulate you for showing up to a great community of people that we are just about one thing about learning here. So thanks for showing up. And number two, make sure you subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts, whether it be on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, whatever, so that you can keep showing up with us as we bring a great new uh, key opinion leader or thought leader every single week uh, in your inbox, and you'll absolutely love it. Also, we take great show notes here. So everything Chuck and I talk about, I'm going to put a link into it, and you'll be able to go straight to the link, see Chuck's website, check out his new book, which I'm going to encourage you to take a look at. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important subject, what a near and dear to my heart, which is how do we rehumanize the workplace in a dental practice or just change the way we think? So, Chuck, thanks for being on, my friend. I appreciate it. Oh, it's great to be here, Kirk. Yeah. Now, wait, before we get rolling, and I, I am going to get rolling and ask you a lot of specific questions. I always like people to know who we're talking to. So sure. who the heck is Chuck Blake? Yeah, it's a good, very good question. My my wife's been trying to figure that out for 42 years. <laughs> I'm, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm left-handed, right-brained, a little bit ADHD, lots of dyslexic. I graduated pretty close to the bottom of my high school class. They actually had me in the principal's office deciding whether they'd let me graduate. It was like a, <laughs> like a, like a, a, a episode from a Charlie Brown movie. I'm looking at all these adults' knees, and they're going wah 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 wah. And they, I think they finally decided if we don't graduate him, we'll have him for next year. So let's get him out of here. <laughs> Took me 19 years to get a college degree. Um, they didn't know what ADHD and dyslexic was back there. They knew what left-handed was, and they didn't like that either. Uh, so. <laughs> So I just didn't relate. This didn't relate to the whole thing. The whole educational thing was a mystery to me. And, um, I just thought I was stupid. So I joined the army. And uh, because I figured they were the only ones who would take me, I had, I finally did get a, a, a high school diploma. So joined the army, played in the army band, um, clarinet and played in the army band. And, and while I was in there, I started my first business kind of by almost by accident. And realized, well, maybe I got something to offer the world. And uh, fast forward 42 years later, I built 12 businesses and in eight industries on four continents. And, and now I focus most of my energies in helping dentists figure out uh, how to not do all the dumb stuff I did. Wow. Wow. Well, I, we're going to go deep. We're going to do this one. And I want to do another podcast that's going to be specific about the lifestyle aspect. But yeah. why is, before we get into the book and the topic, why is this topic so important? Like, why is it an important subject today? Yeah, it's so important, Kirk, because uh, if you look at the history of work, <clears throat> what we find is that we wrecked work when we started building factories. The more factories we got, the more we wrecked work. Everything we're going to talk about today is going to sound really forward thinking and all that avant-garde stuff. I'm not that smart. All I did was look past the look 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 beyond us, past in the past, beyond the factories, and found all the things that should come back to work. And so we just want to bring back work work the way it was before 1850, which was the first time that more stuff was made in factories in the history of man than in homes and shops. So that's why it's important is we have dehumanized work. Uh, and we've got to figure out how to rehumanize it. And Kirk, that's so salient that the word rehumanize isn't even a word. Dehumanize is a word. We got that one. Well, in God's name, don't we have rehumanize as a word? Wow. So I like I, it. You're rewriting things. So I had yeah. I had editors who didn't want me to put it on the front of the book because it's not a word. Right. Wow. <laughs> wow. Now, so take us through this. You know. Um, and I, I would imagine even this concept has been flipped on its head with a pandemic this year. I mean, everybody's, you know, you've heard the conversation about culture, about yeah. how we keep people engaged, all this stuff. Give us a little further perspective. You said, okay, I'm quoting you, no practice should have a manager. Okay. What yeah. does that mean? Like, tell yeah. us what that means. And I want to I want to let the managers know their jobs are not in jeopardy. It's okay. We'll, we'll we'll definitely find a place for you where you will actually be happier and more fulfilled and and make a bigger impact. Yeah. So this is what do you know what dehumanizes us um, is other people telling us what to do. 
That's fundamentally dehumanizing. Uh, and why is that dehumanizing? Well, you ask the question, what makes us human? So I had to study that. Well, there's two things that make us human more than anything else. One is awareness. You know, I'm aware that I'm, I, I was born, I'm aware I'm going to die, and I'm aware I'm around you and others. And so we have a level of awareness that most other creatures don't at a level that others don't, and that makes us human. And secondly is creativity, that we are fundamentally creative. The joke in, anal or the joke in wildebeest will wade the stream, wade the river for 10,000 years. I'm going to wade that river twice and I'm figuring out how to build a bridge. Right. <laughs> We're just fundamentally creative. Uh, we right. can't help ourselves. We're always trying to figure stuff out. Michelangelo walked around this block of marble, he said, walked around this block of marble until he found out what was in there. And he just chipped away everything that didn't belong there. And David popped out. Right. It's a, right. You know, so creativity is our is in our nature. Welding is creativity, going to work, figuring out how should I get to work, being an accountant, how should I do? It's all creativity. It's not an arts and, and musician thing. Creativity is fundamental to the, the human spirit. And if you are not being creative, you're, 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 uh, you're bored. Okay. Uh, Let me be devil's advocate because I'm sure you hear this all the time. Chuck, I totally get it. Like I want people to be creative, but when I'm hiring people, like I don't want them doing their own thing. Just show up with like, we got patients yeah. to take care of. We have expectations <laughs> to meet. I yeah. can't just say you do whatever you want to do. Just right. get creative, paint, whatever you want to paint. We're good. You can't do that. Right? Nope. No, you cannot. The best electronics in the world, the uh, the receivers and the transmitters and all the and the all that all that audio equipment, they are made in Japan. Why? And in Germany to some extent, but mostly in Japan. At least for twenty five or thirty years, they ruled. You know, San, Sanyo and and uh, and uh, uh, Sony and all these guys, and it's because they designed their their stuff by committee. They had three or four or five people doing that, uh, doing that work of complex design of processes and, and all the guts that go in there. They had a bunch of people involved in that stuff. So this is not asking people to be rugged individuals. That's dead. That's got to go away. That came in with the factories more than anywhere else. Uh, we've got to ask people to live in community which is the next big conversation at work. How do we get people to live in community? And I don't make decisions in a vacuum. I make decisions with my team. So the three of us at the front desk, we make decisions. I don't make decisions, screw the other two or screw the back office. No, we make decisions. And before we implement the decision, we talk to the other people in the other parts of the practice and say, here's what we want to do. Can you find anything wrong with it? Can you poke some holes in it? Can you help us with it? So decisions are made, never made in a vacuum, you know, okay. in a healthy group. We talk about the participation age. Right. That, that we're living in the participation age now. There's two hallmarks of the participation age. One is participation. I want to participate in building a great company or a great practice, not for you, but with you. Right. And secondly is sharing. I want to share in the rewards of that. So we participate together. So yeah, don't don't hire the rugged individualists. They won't fit in. Okay, because you and I are going to be friends because I already love the way you think and this is fantastic. But again, I'm going to dish you the questions that I yeah. get. And yeah. I don't know the answers, but like, we're not seeking consensus here either. Like, no. when you're, can you talk about consensus and collaboration? Because that's a hot topic right now. Because <laughs> a dentist might be saying, look, I do want that. But yeah. Chuck, do I have the veto power to go, look, that's not the vision of the practice type yeah. of a thing. And what if they get upset? What right. if I have three people that are like, we're gonna make a decision with the practice, and he said no. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, what do yeah. you think of that? Yeah, and, and I, I get that all the time. I had one dentist say, hey, I just designed the best uh, incentive program for the team. I'm so excited about it. And he was he was sitting there on the Zoom call with his, his uh, office leader, not his office manager, and the other dentist. And, he, and, I said, and I asked him, so have you asked them what would incentivize them? crickets. <laughs> no. Well, do you think that would be a good idea before you tell them what the incentive is? And he, and he said, well, actually, I'm afraid to. And I totally got it. And I, and I knew where he was going because this, this would be my reaction. Why are you afraid to? And he said, well, what if they come up with something I can't do? And I didn't have to answer the question. They had a good enough relationship that his office leader turned to him and said, well, then you just say, I can't do that. Go try again. <laughs> so you're still not telling them what to do, but you're not, you're, you're not, 
This is a community. Remember, it's participation. The dentist gets to participate too. And who owns the freaking place? Yeah. And who All wants right. to make sure that those people still have jobs? So that thing, that incentive program sounds great for you. That will put us out of business in about 12 months and you won't have a job. Right. So we can't do that because it's not the best thing for you. So we participate together. Right. Now go back to the community thing because I love that. Now, I also want you to talk about all the research. You've seen it like you got people, you got entire workplaces now that are not just disengaged, they're actively disengaged in some respect. And that's a huge oh, challenge yeah. in the American workforce. Oh, so how, how important is community to building yeah. a great brand, great company, great anything? Yeah, um, uh, not Google, uh, who is it? Um, Gallup does this survey every month on engagement. So somewhere between 28 and 32% for the last 15 years, 28 to 32% are engaged. The rest of them are just essentially mentally phoning it in. They just come into work from eight to five and they pull the Kiyosaki principle of employment, which is I will work, I will pay you only so little, uh, I will pay you only so much as to for you to not quit and you will work only so hard as to not get fired. <laughs> I mean, 32%. Think about that, Kirk. If, if you had a CT scanner that worked 32% of the time, would you say, well, what are you going to do? You know, everybody has CT scanners like that. You'd freak out yes. and you'd do whatever you could. You don't, you don't want to just throw away the CT scanner. They're expensive. So you'd work with it. You'd have somebody take it apart, put it back together. You'd oil it. You'd hug it. You'd do whatever you could to get it to work. And if you couldn't, you'd find some other machine that would work at 100%. And that's the philosophy behind all of this is nobody should be working at 32%. And right. we, we should have a team of 13 people or 10 people and all 10 of them are 100% engaged all the time. So how do we get to that? You know, that's the key because this isn't happening. And it's even worse. 84% of people before COVID, 84% of people had their, were, had, were, answered the survey, I have not yet found something I love doing. Wow, that's a huge percentage. When you put it in context, like, like I don't want a surgeon that fails thirty-two percent of the time. Or how about a how about a pilot? He's like, yeah, yeah what you know, sixty-eight percent of the time we land okay. You know, you know yeah. I do my math. What are you, yeah. you going to do? Planes fall out of the sky all the time. So you know, it, it, this is unacceptable, and we have accepted it since the dawn of the first factories. And the reason we've accepted is because people are dehumanized at work. So we, we, you and I talked about one question before that, that we came on that leads to this, why, why no, no practice should have managers. What makes us human is creativity. And creativity is nothing more, nothing less than a series of decision makings. I have a music background and I compose. And it's just, well, should I go this direction? Should I go that direction? That doesn't sound right. Let's go here. Let's try that. It's a series of decisions. So the question being, so that's what makes us human, but what more salient to our conversation is what makes us adult on top of that. And it's related. It's decision-making. It's the fancy term is agency of responsibility. I get to eat ice cream any joking time I want. Well, guess what? You get to eat ice cream anytime you want. And that is also a problem. <laughs> okay. Go back to that agency of responsibility. Explain yep. that a little bit more. In yeah. Detail. So when I was in college, the first day I was in college, I bought some ice cream and threw it in my freezer. And as I'm closing the freezer in the apartment, I froze mid-step and I opened it up. And then I said, I get to eat this anytime I want. And as I was closing it, I opened it again. I said, oh, no, I get to eat this anytime I want. Been there. That's agency of responsibility. The ability to make decisions. That's the single thing that separates us from childhood more than anything else. Children make almost no decisions and they certainly don't make big ones. And, and as we get older, we get to make more and more. And that's the definition of adulthood more than anything else is agency of responsibility. So, what? So okay, great, I'm an adult. Well, all right, let's put that in the context of the practice. What's the one thing most people in a dental practice are not allowed to do at work? Make decisions. Right. Make decisions. You know, we're, we're not human beings, we're human doings. Here's your process, here's your protocol, here's your software, here's your pen, here's your pencil, here's everything you need to do, here's exactly how, let me tell you how to do everything. And it's the fundamental problem with management. Managers are hired to tell. Okay. That's how they find their value. I'm more experienced, I've been through all this, I wanna save you from all this nonsense that I've gone through. So I'm gonna speed up your process. And the, the, the singular assumption in hiring managers is, if you have eight people and they work at X speed, if you put a manager in the mix, they will, they will work X plus enough to pay for the manager and give you excess profit. 
Otherwise, you don't need a manager. So that assumption is built in that the manager will bring you more money and make them more productive. Right. Now, again, I love this, and I'm going to just ask you the tough questions, and I'm not the smartest guy, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here. Chuck, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down, but let's say I got a team member who's an assistant. She's never done this job before. I get you, you know, like yeah. some, you know, you, you've heard the analogy, you teach a person to fish and they, oh, yeah. life. sometimes you got to learn, you got to teach them how to use the, the, you know, the rod, put the tap, you know, the bait yeah. on like the art of it. Be, and then what do you do from there? So yeah. speak to that. Yeah. So training is very, very different than telling and training is temporary. And even in training, the best training, anyone will tell you the best training is to ask questions, not to tell people what to do. So what do you think you should do next? I'm not sure. Well, what do you see? Well, I see this. Oh, well, what do you see about that? That's harder to do, but that is much better training. That will last with them longer. So training is very different than telling. I need someone to, to instruct me on how to get the software up and running uh, and, and, and things like that. So that, that's a totally valid, valuable, valid thing. But when it comes to designing a process for how to, how to work with a, a, a patient coming through the front door, New patient acquisition. Who uh, who knows the most about that? There's two or three people at the front desk picking up the phone every day saying, hey, I just heard about your practice and yada, yada, off we go. And yet we've got some practice manager or dentist uh, coming up with a genius script for them and, and, and imposing it on them, walking out of their gilded cover, you know, uh, mahogany office and imposing it on them and walking back into their office. And their job is to execute that script. What if it's wrong? What if it's 80% right? What if it's 95% wrong and 5% disastrous? What are the front desk people going to do? Well, here's a principle. Input equals ownership. Okay, wait. Now you're going to have to go deeper on that one. Explain that one. Input equals ownership. The more input I have in anything I'm supposed to do, the more ownership I will have in making sure it gets done right. Mm -hmm. Input equals ownership. Another way to say the same thing is people commit to what they create. Right. So if you create the process and you, and you impose it on, even if they think it's brilliant, they won't own it. Right. And so the 5% that's broken, they're not looking for that. It's right. your process. We assume you're the manager. You're the genius. You put together a great process. We're just going to run it. And if it's broken, not my fault. Yeah. Now have you I ever, have you I, ever heard anybody say it's not my job? Oh, that will like, get you fired at my company. <laughs> Cause it's everybody's job, right? Everything is everybody's job. If you see anything that you think might be wrong, you don't say, well, you know, somebody ought to do something about that. Or I can't wait until the manager figures that one out. Mm -hmm. That will get you fired. Even if it's not your responsibility, it's your job to get that to somebody else. Yeah. Now I agree with most everything you've said, almost everything you've said. Now, <laughs> when people create something, they own it, but let's speak to this. And again, I'm not, I'm not trying to be like, sure. you know, controversial here because this is, this is the world we live in. And I, I found this to be true. When you have a right hire, you never have to manage them. You never think about them. You never worry about them. They just always do it. So are you talking about speaking about outcomes? Like if you bring somebody in and you want them to be creative and you want their input, do you know what I mean? To for ownership, are you talking outcomes with them? Are you talking because what yes. if their input is like not going to create the outcome? You got it. So here's the mantra: managers tell, leaders ask. Managers tell, leaders ask. If you are telling, you're you're managing. Elon or not Elon Musk, uh, Jack Dorsey, the CEO of Twitter and Square, says, "When I am making decisions, I am not leading." Making decisions is a failure of leadership. It's a brilliant way to go. We'll get, we'll, we'll, we'll unpack this some more, but uh, so what do we do if we're leaders? Well, we don't tell, we ask. So here's a great question to ask. Hey, front desk, what percentage of people that call us that uh, for, uh, to, to potentially come in and be our patient, what percentage of those people do you think we should acquire? Now, what does a manager normally do? Hey, front desk, we need 84%. We need 73. You know, they tell, here's what we need. And what do the people at the front desk do? They nod and they make it look like they're actually on board with this. Cause if they don't, they'll get fired. Mm -hmm. They're not on board with it at all. It's somebody else's 
decision. It's somebody else's process. Input equals ownership. They have no input. They have no ownership. So what if you said, hey, front desk, what do you think the percentage ought to be? Or, hey, hygienist, in the case of my incentives thing, what would, you, what would incentivize you? You cannot lose by asking that question. Love that question. Because remember, you don't have to accept the answer as gospel. This is not chaos and anarchy. Mm -hmm. If they say we ought to have 103%, well, first you help them with their math, you know, because that doesn't work. Or if they say 28%, then you help them, you, you walk them through what that would do to the bottom line and how quickly they would lose their jobs. And, so, you know, you, you work with them to help them understand that that won't work. Try again. But I'm still not going to tell you what we should do. And the, the other reason, Kirk, that this is such a brilliant thing to do is ask people what do they want or what can they do is because you find out what they really think mm -hmm. and what they really think they could do. Google hired me for a very short period of time. We figured out it was not a mutually uh, beneficial relationship because they're stuck in the stone age, man. I mean, you talk about a company that's living in 2000 or 1990 or 1904. I was reeling while I was there, man, this place is so factory system. It's unbelievable, but they couldn't get, they could not figure any of this stuff out. They had, uh, I had one guy who, who manages 2000 people. He said, well, I don't, or he, he, actually he managed 200. His boss managed a, a thousand and the guy above him managed 2000. Well, the guy, two, two people up said, okay, here's our goal for the year. And then he gave it to the guy with a thousand people. And the guy with a thousand people gave it to him with 200 people. And then he gave it to his people. And he said, I don't understand. They all want to talk about it. They want to talk about it. And they don't seem to be really on board. And then I've learned that in the last couple of weeks since we told them what the goal was, they're all just laughing at us behind our backs. And I don't understand why. Input equals ownership. No input, no ownership. So, you know, we've got to break that, that uh, bubble. And how do we do it? We ask questions. What if the heat ask, hey, what do you guys think we can do? And they might've come up with something half as big as what he did, or you know what? They might've come up with something twice as big as what he wanted. Right. And he right. might've actually had to talk them down. I've done that at times. How in the God's name do you think we can get all that done? <laughs> and I have to talk them down to what I wanted or, or closer to what I wanted. And so I go up and they come down. Or in some cases I'm above their goal and then they're below mine. And I say, well, have you considered this? Right. Oh no, we didn't consider that. Okay, so maybe your goal can be a little bigger. Yeah, well, what about this? And so maybe I can help them get their goal up. Because the reality is, Kirk, if you can give anybody, you can impose any goal you want on anybody, but if they don't believe in it, it's not going to come true. Right. So, so start with what do you want? You know, this is an old negotiation tactic, by the way. You've heard this a million times in, in, in uh, buying stuff. He who talks money first loses. Right. So, you know, get, and it's not about win or loss. It's just, I really want to know what motivates these people because if they're motivated by half of what I need, then we either need to get them up to something more or I need to get different people. Right. I need to find that out. I'm not going to impose something and have them hiding behind my fake goals. So right. managers tell, leaders ask. Yeah. Now, another thing you say is you say everyone should be a leader. Now, no. Fundamentally, that's a pretty big statement, but break that down for us. Yeah, so it's fun when I go to a, speak at a dental conference, I'll ask, you know, there's 200, 500,000 people in the audience. All right, uh, shout out some examples of leadership, either people or images of leaders. And people say, guy in white horse out front, uh, George Patton, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher. You know, and they give you all these epic, you know, Ronald Reagan, uh, Abraham Lincoln, they give you all these epic personalities. And then I, I let them, I help them understand that that is actually the rarest form of leadership. It's, it's a visionary motivational leadership is the rarest form. And it's a good thing because you really don't need uh, in a, in a, in an army of 300 people, you don't really need 300 people out front on a white horse. No, <laughs> you just don't. So motivational leadership and visionary leadership is rare, but what do we always think of when we think of leadership that, and we think that's what leadership is. There's three other kinds at least, and all of us can practice all four, not just the, th the, the three. So one of them is uh, I can be something. I can be something. My character, I'm kind. I'm gentle. I'm, I'm a listener. I'm, uh, I'm silver-tongued. I'm, you know, fill in the blank, and I can lead you with that. Have you ever been in a room where somebody walked in the room who's kind, and you just 
you, the temperature of the room just goes down and you just try and be kinder while they're there. Right. So here's a, and so let me give you the definition of leadership that I use that'll help you with all four of these. I should have done that to begin with. Leadership is any act that improves the life, situation, or performance of another individual. Leadership is any act that improves the life, situation, or performance of another individual. By that definition, who can act? Who, who can lead? Everybody. Anybody. So anybody, anybody can be kind, and I can, and that'll rub off on me. You know, things I've learned because I'm I'm married, and the things I got from my wife that I would have never picked up, including my socks. <laughs> it's just bizarre. You know, she's led me in so many ways in my life, and I've led her. That's leadership. And the second one is is uh, um, being um, doing. So being and then doing. Someone who's more skilled, more more capable in in patient acquisition or patient retention, or or as a doctor, you know, as a dentist, being more skilled in certain kinds of surgery. And and so you you say, hey, how can I learn from you? Can I watch you? Can you make a video of that? Can you know? Can I listen to you on the phone? That's leadership. And then the third one that we didn't talk about besides inspirational is relational or relate. Be, do, relate, inspire. Those are the four. And relate is, can you be a friend for crying out loud? Can you be a mediator, a negotiator? Um, you know, can you just relate? Can you be the guy that when you walk in the room, people say, hey, Bob, can you settle this for us? That's leadership. So here's, here's why nobody should have managers. Managers have reports. Leaders have followers. When you impose a manager, you have no idea if anybody's ever actually following. Why? Because the manager has a gun. I can fire you. I can fire you. The leader has no gun. I love this analogy. This will work right here. Gandhi versus Great Britain. Gandhi, or uh, Great Britain, managed India at the point of a gun. Gandhi led India without a single gun. Who won? It's true. Yeah, it's very true. And, and the backstory is Gandhi, when he was 19, moved to South Africa and did not move back to India until he was 42 or 46. He wasn't even Indian, for crying out loud. He just went back because he couldn't stand it anymore. And the guy has no influence, no relationships, no connections, no nothing. And he ends up leading India. Why? Because he had followers. Nobody was following Great Britain. They were just there at the point of a gun. Managers need to become leaders. And they do that by asking questions instead of making statements. Love that. Love that. Now, I want to go into another segment of this when we talk about decision making. And the question is, what truly makes us an adult? Like, you've got a lot of experience with this. Mm -hmm. and this, is, yeah. this is another you know, yeah. important question, but what really makes us an adult? Yeah. And that's, that's fundamental to the idea of rehumanizing the, the workplace. So it's basically uh, tied to the idea of what I shared before on, on agency of responsibility. The, more than any one thing, dis, uh, decision-making makes us adult. But think about this. Uh, I'm, I'm 24 years old and I work in a dental practice. In the last five years, I've decided, or seven years, I've decided where to go to school, what to major in, um, what kind of car I should buy, uh, whether I should get married or not, what kind of house I should buy, and what my future should look like. Those are incredibly big decisions. And then I walk over the, I walk across the threshold of my, of your practice that morning, and I say, hey, doc, why do we do it this way? And you say, because I went to dental school and you didn't. I've heard that, by the way. I've heard that statement. <laughs> What do you think? What is that communicating to that adult? You're not, You're not going to make decisions here. Mm -hmm. You you have no choice. So what do we do? We revert to childhood. We, we and then we find out we like it. That's the poison here. You know, hey, this is I'm getting used to this. I have enough adulting to do at home. I don't need to adult at work. I like being a human doing at work. I like having a manager. Please tell me what to do, and I will simply execute. And if it doesn't work out, it's your fault. This is cool. I got no responsibilities. So we get to be seven years old for the eight hours we're working. Then we go home and we're adults again. Then we get to be seven years old and back. It's nuts. 
And it's also the very, the fundamental problem with disengagement at work. People are out there selling billions of dollars with the disengagement seminars. Disengagement is a result. It's not a process. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is, is, is a, a allow and require, and it's both things, allow and require everyone in the practice to make decisions, not, on a, not in a vacuum, but uh, together with others. And so there's a simple two-step de- uh, decision-making process for that. But I just want this to settle on people. How do you rehumanize the workplace? One simple thing, distribute the decision-making to everybody, to all the leaders. Right. And you do that with two-step, with a simple process we call two-step decision-making. Right. Now, would you agree with this? Like, I love what you're saying. And we, you know, I think if, if anybody's in dentistry, they, you know, at least what listening to this or coming to things that are thoughtful or creating, you fundamentally care for people. And it's an important piece of growing any practice. But would you agree, like, there are some people that are really good at things and they're not good at things. Talk about like yeah. strengths, weaknesses. Yeah. I mean, are you a fan of DISC or like Colby Index or sure. Culture Index? Like- yeah, we, we use a number of those to hire people. And then we're a fan of what we call freedom, pro- freedom mapping. What is that? Tell me what that it's is. It's a form of process mapping. It uses process mapping as its fundamental, as its core. But the purpose of it is to find out what everybody's good at and get them doing that. Free people up. To, into their highest and their best use. You got three people at the front desk. And as you as you map the processes, you look at each step and say, okay, which one of us is actually best at this one? And we both say, well, Janie's better at that. Okay, Janie, will you lead us on that step number three? You know, will you help us, train us, lead us, make sure we're doing that right? Who's best at step number four? Well, Tom's best. Hey, Tom, will you lead us in that? And now we get everybody. It's not that, not a, it's not that only one person answers the phone. But if the phone is, if Janie's available, she's the best on the phone. We've all agreed, including Janie, she should answer the phone when, when she's available. Yeah. Uh, and so we, we get everybody into their highest and best, which also rehumanizes because now I like what I'm doing. Right. You know, the, the old traditional job description works out this way. I hate a third of what I'm doing. I put up with a third of what I'm doing. And I love a third of what I'm doing. <clears throat> How dumb is that? What if we had people doing 60% of what they love and 30% of something that they are okay with and 10% of what they hate? Yeah. They're gonna stay, they're gonna stay longer. And they'd be more productive. Hugely you know, more productive. Enjoy work a little bit yeah, more. You will, make, you will make more money. The 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 joy in this, Kirk, is that all the data is on our on our side. When you when you recreate your your structure of your business around this participation age model. You are more productive, you, you grow faster, you're high, you have higher profitability, you make more money and people stay exponentially longer. Wegmans Groceries on the East Coast. Uh, the, average, uh, the average tenure or the average turnover uh, in, a, uh, in a grocery store is 35% a year. So one out of three people quit every year. At, at Wegmans, 3%. Yeah. And it's because they've given everybody their brains back. And I can give you so many examples like this. Imagine if your your turnover is 3% versus 35. The most expensive hidden cost in business is what we call the the uh, retraining t- or the the uh, uh, the retention tax mm-hmm. or the rehiring tax. Yeah, I love those stats. Actually, quick trip gasoline stations, 51% of employees when polled are considering making it a career. 51%. Wow. Like that's wow. a pretty high yeah. stat. It's a gas station. I mean, it's yeah. more than that. Yeah. You know, but you're you're exactly right. I got a friend that's worked with, for Southwest Airlines forever. He's like, I just love being here. You know, and they don't have to be glamorous things. I mean, they got they got bus boys or, or or guys packing groceries who have been there seven years. Why? Because traditionally, that when they when they've opened a new location in in other cities, they would take a, a seven thirty seven or two seven thirty sevens and pack them full of existing employees, take them there, give them an overnight, have them walk the three sites, and ask them which one do you think we should build on. That's distributed decision making. Mm-hmm. And the, the principle is really simple. The two steps are really simple. Uh, step number one is whoever has to live with the decision should make it. If there are three people at the front desk and you're figuring out how to make get new software, they should make that decision. Now that sounds scary. And by itself, that would be chaos and anarchy. This, step number two fixes it all. Step number So question number one is who has to live with this decision? They should make it. The second question is who uh, who is impacted by this decision? Let's get them involved. 
And now all the all the chaos and anarchy, the rugged individualism, they all goes out because everybody is going to be impacted by that software that they have at the front desk. Finance, you know, the, the guy who buys it, the, the hygienist, the accounting. So we got to get everybody involved in this. But the final analysis is, will you, do you, do the three of you, uh, can you, you know, can you get, embrace this and make it work as your own? And now yeah. they're going to own it because they had input. Yeah. And Chuck, if I'm watching this and I'm a young dentist, this is like drinking from a fire hose because it's a lot. Give me a <laughs> it look. Is, it really is. Break it down for me and just say, hey, look, if I was a young dentist, I got a team of 12 people and I'm trying to do good in the world yeah. and serve my family. Like, where do I even start? Yeah. So two things, uh, three things. One thing, one thing is believe your people are smart and motivated. That's number one. Second thing is ask questions. Don't every, every time you think you want to make a statement to figure out how to turn it into a question. This front office is a mess. Hey guys, what do you see here? <laughs> what do you think this is? You know, how does this look to you? Turn it into a question. What if, what if, okay, so again, let me be devil's advocate. They go, nothing's wrong here. Okay, so so that's good information, isn't it? Wouldn't you like to know that? Right. Instead of just telling them that it's dirty, they yeah. don't think it's dirty. Right. So guess what? It's going to get dirty again as soon as you're, you, uh, you uh, turn your back. You've solved nothing. All you've done is create codependence. Every single time you tell somebody to do something, you have created codependence. I don't have to think. He's going to come tell me when the front office looks bad. So let's come up with a process and let's do some a process around. Okay. So when the, when the magazines are, are not in order like this and the coffee is like this. And the, so let's put it, you know, here's seven things. Let's agree together. What do you think makes for a good front office? And if you got people who don't think it's, they don't ever think it should be cleaned up, then you have either the wrong person. Or you have to get them to change their mind. Right. Uh, so, so that's the second. So thing. wait, wait, wait. You got the rubber, and you get to change their mind. That's so. Give me some science on that one. <laughs> like, yeah. have you have you been have you had a lot of luck in helping people change their minds? Yes, but but it's not changing their orientation. So okay. if they truly are a messy person and don't believe in this, then they're not going to fit. Right. But I can help them. Uh, I can raise the bar for them. That's another thing. Jack Dorsey says the leadership is about raising the bar and always uh, helping us become more excellent. So. Uh, it's it's a process, and it it starts with uh, you know there's three things that don't change our mind: truth, choice, and and uh, emotional or or uh, emotional experiences. What changes us is to see the world differently. So I have to work with them, and I have to say, okay, here's here's an image of one uh, front office, and here's the image of another front office. What do you see here? Which one would you want to walk into? Why? And that takes time. It takes energy. I don't have time for that crap. I'm too busy filling molars. Well, then you're going to create codependence and you're going to wonder why every day you're in dentistry, you're always having to tell people what to do. It's because you told people what to do. If you trained them by helping them see why, that's the biggest thing. You're one of the most power, the most powerful, the best, most powerful question and the least asked question in business is why. Who, what, when, where, and how should always be preceded by why. So rather than clean up this darn front office, why does this, you know, why, do, why should it look any differently? Unless they have why, why is the most human of questions. It's the one that motivates us. And unless they know why the office should look differently, it ain't never going to be their deal. So uh, management is nothing more, nothing less than pure, unadulterated codependence. Here's the, here's the classic definition of codependence. I didn't make this up. Think of a manager as I share this definition. Doing for others what they could or should do for themselves. You classically That's, teach them to under function when you do yeah, that. Yeah. yeah. And so when they, when, when they come to you and say, or, uh, uh, what should I do? And you answer with, you should do this, codependence. If they come to you and say, what should I do? And you ask them the psychologist question, what do you think you should do? <laughs> You know, and why should you do that? So I want to give you a very quick story because people are thinking this is a bunch of hogwash. Uh, and I'll give you the most difficult environment where this could possibly work. A U.S. Navy submarine. Uh, about 15 years ago, uh, David Marquet took, uh, took over the Santa Fe. It was the worst rated submarine in the entire U.S. Navy for three years running. So let that settle in. 143, 134 people in the crew, three years running, worst rate, rated sub. In one year, he turned it into the best rated submarine in the entire U.S. Navy. And here's the kicker. He didn't change out any of the 134 people. Hmm. 
What do you do? This is not a people problem. This is a management problem. I mentioned maybe earlier, managers make people stupid and lazy. They're not stupid and lazy for the most part. And he did one simple thing. He distributed the decision-making. He got these people together and said, okay, this may not sound like the right thing to do. I know I'm called commander, but I'm not going to command. I'm going to do something really weird here. We're going to call this intentional leadership. And you're going to come to me or anybody else that you think needs to be impacted by your decision, step number two. And you're going to say, I intend to, and then you're going to tell them what you decided that you think might work. And then my, re my job is going to be to ask you hard questions. Managers tell, people, leaders ask. So have you thought about the rest of the U.S. Navy and how this impacts them? How about, how does this, how does this affect the cook? How does this affect the torpedo room? You know, and, and so he's going to ask hard questions just to get them to align their decision with reality. He says, I'm not going to tell you what to do. And he said, I will not do it even in combat. I will not tell you what to do. And so they, they regularly went through exercises with other Navy ships as if the other Navy ships were Russian and they were, you know, combat situations and he never told them what to do and they came out the number one rated submarine in the whole u.s navy why because he rehumanized the workplace he gave everybody their brain back by allowing and requiring that they all learn how to make decisions not in a vacuum but in community it's powerful buddy powerful stuff and i know we're only like this is only the tip of the iceberg now chuck any last thoughts before we wrap up i want to talk about your book and then do you have a podcast do you have one? yeah yeah, we do have one. It's called the Got Dental Podcast. Get off the treadmill. G O T T. Get off the treadmill podcast. All right, I'm gonna check that out. Got get off podcast. the treadmill. I love yeah. that. I love that. Cool. Now, give us a couple last thoughts, and then I want to talk about your book. Yeah, there's really only one. As as everybody's listening to this, they uh, well, they might feel like uh, they just don't know where to start. Well, the the place to start is with your own mindset. The question is, do you believe people are stupid and lazy? fundamentally on, you know, there's a spectrum, smart and motivated, stupid and lazy. Where on that spectrum do you, people, do you believe people fundamentally are? Are they in the middle? Are they on the stupid and lazy, lazy end or the smart and motivated side? I, I would say it's your mindset. And, and it is your mindset that decides that. And there's, there was research on that. A, a, a researcher actually looked at this, uh, looked at different uh, factories and different companies within the same industry and found that when the leadership thought people were smart and motivated, like David Marquet did, gee, what a surprise. Everybody there is smart and motivated. In the exact same industry, exact same circumstances, people thought they're stupid and lazy, and they're all stupid and lazy. So we have a problem, and it's not the people. We have to start with, are we? do I believe people are smart and motivated? That's where the whole thing falls and, 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 and or arises. If I believe people are smart, are stupid and lazy, then don't bother to try any of this stuff. It won't work. If you believe people are smart and motivated and the stupid and lazy or the lazy is the exception that you have to deal with, fine. But the majority of people manage to the best or lead, lead, to, the, lead to the top. Bring people to the top. Don't drag them all to the bottom by managing them. I totally agree. I love this, buddy. Now, tell us about your book. You've written a couple books, right? Now yeah, I've written three. Uh, okay. Three that are published. And uh, the third one, I just came out a couple weeks ago. It's called Rehumanizing the Workplace by Giving Everybody Their Brain Back. And it's the, the things we talked about to get today. There's 12 tools in that book that will help a practice basically go from a top-down structure to a horizontal structure where we all learn how to, to rely on each other and work happens better, faster, with more process, with better metrics. It all works better. And it's not a transition. You will immediately see the impact that you will go up. So uh, rehumanizing the workplace by giving everybody their brain back. They can get that on Amazon. Just go Blakeman rehumanize and you'll find us for rehumanizing. Uh, and then they can get a hold of us by uh, uh, chuckblakeman.com. Just That's go awesome. to chuckblakeman.com. That's awesome, buddy. Well, I hope the world goes back to normal somewhat soon and we can have a beer on the road or something. Yeah, like you know that. what? I didn't I didn't write this book for this, but we actually put a sticker on the front of it, the go-to book for remote work, because this is how, what you have to do to, awesome. to make it work. It's so true. You know, we just don't we're learning to to evolve in this kind of an environment. So there we are. I am so grateful to have you on here. I'm going to have you back again, and we're going to go a little bit deeper on the lifestyle type practice for a dentist. Cool. And even what that means. So um, it's good stuff. So stick around, Chuck, while I say goodbye to everybody else. But 
Thank you guys for showing up to the Best Practices Show podcast. If you enjoyed today, which I know you did, do us a favor, just hit the share button, share with your friends. Keep sending us suggestions for shows, things that you want to see. Even with Chuck, I'll have him back again and again and again, and we'll put him on the hot seat and ask him some good questions, some of the stuff we all deal with. So, uh, And until we see you next time, keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.